Buzzword Bingo. It's a game you should play while you're attending a conference or listening to a speaker or a podcast or even just having a conversation with someone and you have a certain gut check as to what words they're using, what words they're saying, and if they are often just kind of cast out into the wind, oftentimes as industry buzzwords or industry terms that lose a lot of their value when they're used in such a trite and oversaturated way. And let me fully admit, hey, I'm part of the problem here too, just as well. I'm no exception, I'm equally a culprit but there are a lot of these, right? Whether we just sort of throw around the word blockchain or artificial intelligence or machine learning or zero trust, there are a lot of these words that I think, or these statements or phrases that mean a good thing. They are a right idea and a security concept. But at the same time, it's very easy to overlook or just not have the speaker realize, or even us, just any of us, think of the administrative burden or the user experience or the reality that comes with trying to absolutely a thousand percent implement or do a stated thing, especially buzzwords. I do think there are some situations where we sort of ride the trend a little too much. But anyway, hey, this is a Reddit post. It's old, it's 10 months ago, but I thought maybe it's an interesting I I example and a way to get across what I'm thinking here. They ask, hey, why are people here treating zero trust so negatively, like it's a buzzword? word. Genuinely curious why people have this view when brilliant people like incredible leaders, thought leaders in the industry, not to use a buzzword <laughs> paradox there, but they folks will say, look, this is a great security concept. And I'm of the assumption, uh, I'm of the understanding, right, that yes, it is a great security concept. But with that, I think the matter of fact is these are things that we have been saying for years now. I think that we have been uh, touting and expressing and exclaiming you should be using network segmentation. You should use principles of least privilege. You should have access controls. You should be doing zero trust without it having a branded sales and marketing term on top of it. CyberOps over on Twitter or Florian Roth, I think a great individual that a lot of folks know and I certainly look up to and admire. He had this meme, the Scooby-Doo meme, right? Hey, you're pulling off the mask of zero trust and it's just that. It's network segregation and principle of least privilege. Scrolling back down on the Reddit post, I think it's fascinating because you, if I'll link this in the description if folks are interested, because there's a lot of conversation on it. It's because this is being peddled as a product. It's because it's something to buy. It's because it's a vendor trying to get this crammed into your own security stack. And I think there might be an element of that. There's some descriptions and all in here, but there's one specific thing that I really, really love that the author goes ahead and adds as an edited uh, portion of his original post. And they say, look, zero trust is not about eliminating trust. It's about controlling it and how you determine and you decree where trust is allowed to be received from. And let me add a little bit of color in case just folks don't happen to know, hey, what I'm saying when I'm shouting this whole zero trust thing. I'll try to do my best to explain it, all knowing that it is extremely varied and vague and completely amorphous because it's subjective to begin with, hence the problem of these whole buzzwords and definitions thing. But you use your computer and you log in and you go to a web browser, you access some software, you use your applications, and then you go to different sites and you do different things and maybe you're logged in by a, a domain controller even, or you're using some software that's been prescribed by your IT security policy. And how is that all formed? What can be trusted within those compartments? What is the assets and applications that you have taken inventory for and then know I can use this because it is allowed and accepted? Oftentimes for penetration testers or ethical hackers, we kind of think of this as an allow list versus a deny list. And you often want to oh, get around the deny list when you're being a hacker. But in the case that an allow list is significantly more secure, zero trust pushes this to the edge and says, look, I don't want to trust anything. Deny everything and allow things only by exception. Like, everything's off and you have to manually toggle each thing on and on and on for the things that you know that you want. It's hard to do. Now, I don't want to drag you through this entire document or this entire thing here. I know this is a lot of text on the screen, but I think it's interesting when this sort of thing caught fire or started to spread in conversations of, hey, discussing this buzzword, discussing this marketing and sales tactic that we've been using on Zero Trust. And this is the one on the cross here, forgive me, but I think a lot of these could apply to different buzzwords. NSA and other big players were saying, look, here's our hot take, here's our piece, here's our perspective. One thing you got to keep in mind, if leaders or people or anyone in this party here is unwilling or unable to do what they need to do to fully realize this, whether or not they uh, can't spend the money for it, they don't have the talent, they don't have people, expertise, then it falls apart. 
The benefits of zero trust will not be realized in that environment. It just falls to the ground, falls flat on its face. It's a fascinating thing because with zero trust, you have to be all in. And that is so hard to do because it's fatigue. It's literally a notification, a nuisance every single time that you want to do something and you've got to click the go button, add it to the allow list, and then constantly reevaluate. Is that right? Should that be in the allow list? And I'll touch on that in a little bit of in a little bit, but my face is in the way here and I'm sorry, there's a, a really sharp and strong line I think at the end here. Constantly applying the default deny security policies and then trying to play in that with the administrator burden, with the tougher user experience in this balance of security versus convenience. If zero trust falters, if you try to do this and you can't go all in, the benefits just fall away. It becomes significantly degraded or eliminated is that very last line. So let me surface and propose to you here our hacker mindset, our ethical hacker, penetration tester, red teamer, bug bounty, whatever you want to adopt in this offensive adversary emulation hat. Look, you know, and I think it's, it's truth that we get to the bottom of it. You come into this thing wanting to beat it up and wanting to see how you could bend the rules here. And you realize, look, I don't need to break the whole technology. I don't have to tear down a zero trust architecture. I just need to break the implementation. I need to find the weakness that a person at the end of the day made a mistake or misconfigured something, or the reality is there was just some accident that allowed for a gaping security hole in some way that they could work around the rules. So if I may, let me show you this in a sort of tactical way. Let's do some real show and tell and demos here. Let's say I log into my Windows computer. I'm a low privilege user, Joe Schmo, and I've got the calculator application on my desktop. Native, regular Windows application, program and software, but now let me change perspectives into a security administrator, into the local admin on this device. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, put on and turn on some of the control settings that allow me to lock things down, to know my environment, to have a baseline of what's good and what's bad, allow list and deny list. And I'm gonna do that with App Locker. Now I know, hey, some of you security gurus are gonna say, hey, 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 App Locker is not what we should be using now. We got WDAC. We got Windows Defender application control, and you're absolutely right. AppLocker is so Windows 7. Uh, WDAC is the new hotness, I think, for more modern operating systems. And Microsoft has even decreed that AppLocker is not to be used as a security mechanism or security boundary. With that, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. I think a significant amount of people, a significant amount of organizations, businesses, and companies are still going to be using this because it's easy and they know how because we've done it for like this for a certain amount of time. So what I'm doing on screen here is going around and actually setting all of the default Microsoft given and provided rules to configure lockdown environment like, hey, you can only run Windows applications. You can only run Microsoft signed stuff in its normal application location, whether it's in program files, whether it's in C Windows, yada, yada, yada. Turn on the application ID service so that that is running. Use GPD update to actually turn that switch and toggle it on. And then, fingers crossed, once we reboot, once we're back in action, App Locker is enabled. I'd love to be able to do this with WDAC, and I hope to maybe get another fun kind of show and tell with that in the future. But I wanted to bring this one to you because now that our system administrator has turned on the security setting, let's log back in as Joe Schmo, and let's see if we could even run the Windows calculator application. Granted, it's a regular Windows file, Windows application and program, but it's on the desktop. Is it gonna be allowed to run? Clicking on the desktop icon here, no. This application has been blocked by your system administrator. AppLocker is telling us we cannot do that. And with this, hey, our security administrators, our IT team is putting their feet up on the dash. We're good. We just kind of slapped on the quick and easy rules and now we don't have that attack surface, right? Let me chat about this a little bit more. I'm showing you the distinction in running Calculator, that Calc application from flat Windows System 32, totally allowed to run, A-OK -okay and good, but if it were on the desktop, again, outside of that natural organic location, not allowed to run. Those are some of the rules that we're being seeing applied by AppLocker. However, if I just put this executable, this application in another potentially world writable location, like C Windows Tasks, and that is inside of C slash Windows, some of that root location of the file system, totally cool. We can just still run the calculator, even if it's not strictly in System32. 
the restriction with the default given provided Microsoft rules with AppLocker is that it just has to be under the tree of the file system path C Windows. So let me switch the perspective here. Now let's become the attacker. Now let's be the adversary. Let's log into our Kali Linux desktop so we know that we're cool. We know they're a real hacker. Uh, that's a joke. <laughs> and I want to do something cool. I want to fire off the real badness. I want to be kicking off Cobalt Strike. Let's say, hey, I've got Cobalt Strike over here, firing up a team server so that myself and my other hacker friends can get into the campaign, do the op, and now let's do some damage. And hey, before we get into the super sweet stuff, I think this is a perfect opportunity to take a moment to thank the sponsor of this video. Perfect tie-in with the theme of knowing your applications, knowing your assets, knowing your environment and your baseline so you know what you're protecting in defense. You can't protect what you can't see. Visibility across your own environment and network lays the foundation for your cybersecurity posture. But how can you uncover and map out all of your infrastructure across potentially hundreds or thousands of assets? Try Run Zero. Run Zero is a cyber asset management solution, and it's the fastest and easiest way to build a full asset inventory. Get proactive about your security program and accelerate your incident response. Get the data and context about your devices, services, and configurations that you need to effectively manage and secure your environments. You can take advantage of Run Zero's integrations with your already existing IT and security stack. With Run Zero, you can augment your tools already in place to achieve maximum coverage across all of your assets between local IT information technology, OT operational technology, IoT Internet of Things, cloud endpoints, work from home hosts, and even your unmanaged assets. With Run Zero, you can build your entire asset inventory in minutes. Use my link in the video description to start a free trial with Run Zero and rapidly create your own asset inventory. Know your environment and build the baseline for an improved cybersecurity posture. Huge thanks to Run Zero for sponsoring this video. Okay, back in the action here, we're firing up Cobalt Strike, logging into our team server, and what I'm gonna do is go ahead and create an attack payload. I'm gonna go ahead and create just a regular, simple, hey, super duper easy HTA file, or an HTML application that is one of those sweet files in Windows that the operating system will just sort of willingly execute with languages like VBScript, Visual Basic Script, JScript, the Windows Microsoft dialect of JavaScript, client-side code. And bear in mind that mshta.exe, the interpreter or that processor that actually executes those things, is again native and inherent, actual legitimate Windows software. So if I, again, press the I believe button here with me, if got this payload on the target machine, it, whether it's a phishing email, whether it's some drive-by download, whether it's some, again, fooling the user, now I can do some damage because, check it out, firing this exploit off is going to fail because app lockers in the way. It is blocked by group policy. Check out, contact your system administrator if you really need to run this application. App locker is blocking this because of our zero trust and big air quotes architecture. It won't run. We're not getting our beacon back. But what if I, as a little bit of a smarticle threat actor here, what if I actually had a little bit of know-how and I wasn't just a script kitty? What if I took a look at this code? What if I reached into my own payload and I realized, oh, what this is doing is going to be a unhexlifying or decoding some hexadecimal to build out an executable beacon.exe and it slaps it on the file system so that it can run and detonate. Thing is, it's putting it into the temporary folder at the moment. But what if I were able to actually tweak that and change that to another world writable and accessible file under the C colon backslash Windows subdirectory. All of those things trickle down. Hey, I found a spot just because I was able to find it. Access check with sys internals. Not too hard to be able to find some of those folders where we have that write permission. SysWow task Microsoft Windows PLA system, whatever. You got that access. You could do that. You could figure that out with just a duplicate Windows 11 virtual machine. This is on Windows 11, by the way. Now I go ahead and download that. Hey, say that user somehow got tricked, somehow got fooled, click it, run it, pressing the I believe button, bam. Threat actor has access. 
We've got our shell, we have our implant, we have our beacon running and listening, and now we could do whatever damage we want, all while playing within the rules of our app locker security policy. I know, I know, hey, maybe this is a super distilled and watered down example of that zero trust mentality, deny everything, allow by exception, but look at how much we've been able to do just by simply changing a line of code. And with that, let me tie this back down to some of that idea and that mentality here. Look, security is a game of cat and mouse. It's the balance between convenience, privacy, security, all of these things. And the threat actors and the adversaries, they're going to play in that pool. They're going to try and circumvent those rules or figure out how to bend them and do different things with them. Regardless of this zero trust buzzword or AI, ML, blockchain shenanigans, they don't need all this fancy stuff and neither do defenders sometimes. But the biggest point I want to drive home is that it's not about the technology. It's not about the buzzword, the branding that we slap on this thing. It's about the people who can figure it. It's about the individuals and the owners and the administrators and the network engineers and the architectures and developers that put this thing together. Security is only as strong as the people behind it. Because what if, let me show you this thing. Say you got this little pop-up, little dialogue thing that just fired up from the bottom right of your computer screen or whatever. Windows just says, hey, 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 we got a little application. We got a program that's trying to start Google Chrome, your web browser, your daily use, everyday web browser. It needs permission to run on this device. Would you be willing to add this program to your allow list? Are you willing to run your web browser? And you're like, well, yeah, of course. Absolutely, I need my web browser to be able to run and do my job. So you click allow. But let me show you this in a different font. Literally super stupid, super simple, trivial, dumb idea. Because Windows will show you this in like a sans font, you might just not even easily recognize some of the things where a adversary or threat actor will decorate and sort of design and, I don't know, prettify and masquerade their malware, their executables and their bad evil stuff as a legitimate application, as something to fool the user yet again. Take a look. I don't know if you noticed that Google Chrome is not Google with an L, it's with a capital letter I, that will just slip right under the radar in a sans font, and you might be none the wiser. You just allow that malware to run, you've given it permission to execute within your zero trust architecture. So question for you when we get to that point, where is now the responsibility? Where is the administrator burden or user burden or any of this fallen to? Who is who takes the onus of like, okay, clicking the go button and saying, yep, 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 allow that program to run. You're at fault now, which is a weird, crazy thing, but because you've come to this, I don't know, zero trust architecture that you're proudly chest thumping and, and singing trumpets and fanfare for, uh, what is gonna happen when you're signing some lines or crossing some documents, filling stuff out, I don't know, for insurance, for incidents, for breaches? I don't mean to extrapolate out on that, but I do think it is food for thought when we keep trying to bring this to the world and we keep screaming and shouting about these buzzwords when we don't always understand what all it actually means. And even just a watered down distilled example of how we might be able to play around those rules, I think it still happens. It's inevitable. You have to trust software to do what you do and you have to trust your domain controller to log in. <laughs> zero trust or any buzzword, etc. on this buzzword bingo card. It can be scrutinized, it can be played with, it can be critiqued, but at the end of the day, again, sure, it's good ideas and good concepts, but it should not be considered a silver bullet. There is no one size fits all solution. We need to have things layered with defense and depth, yada, 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 you know the drill. But just arm yourself with that when you're looking at something new out there on the horizon or the hot new trendy thing that everyone's talking about, hey, come to the conversation with a little bit more uh, muscle and something to flex when you're like, tell me about this in this context. Tell me about how it might work for people and users and the reality of it all. Uh, I want to get that out there into the ecosystem because I think it needs to be a certain amount of accountability and it needs to be a certain amount of let's look at all this thing together and let's figure out these problems and solve them together. With that, I'm done rambling. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you in the next video.